now to that neighborhood on lockdown as a black bear ran free going from yard to yard. Maybe you remember this story from last summer. A young 300-pound black bear gave chase to wildlife officials in Los Angeles. Acting like a four-legged tourist, turning Southern California backyards and suburban streets into his own magic kingdom. The ordeal became a live cable news hit. Helicopters were broadcasting the bear's every move. The bear's chill. He's like, you know, he hasn't even looked up at us. This bear jumped fences, chilled in the shade of a neighborhood tree, even found a cool way to beat California's summer heat wave. Then taking a dip in a neighbor's pool for nine minutes, barely able to stand up in the shallow end. Okay, the newscaster's bad pun aside, a situation like this can be a big problem. This bear was eventually captured and released. But things like this don't always end so smoothly. Sometimes problem bears like this have to be killed. Slowly, a new philosophy on how to handle bears like this has taken shape. There are new ideas on how to keep bears wild and out of the harmful way of humans, hopefully eliminating the need to kill the bears. This system relies on a very special tool. A dog. A very special kind of dog. From Finland. It's known as the Karelian Bear Dog. And this is their story. And the story of the people who have found a better way to keep our wild neighbours safe. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. We're going to go find some bears. We're going to go find some bears. Hey, are we? <laughs> A feisty little guy. I've come all the way to Montana to meet this little poppy. His name is Teton, and he's a Karelian bear dog. I'll get more into the significance of Teton's special breed in a bit. For right now, all you need to know is that Teton is 12 weeks old, cute as anything, and we're at a training course today. He looks like he could be a big dog in the making. Eh? Yeah. He's got some good-sized yeah. paws. All Karelian bear dogs have thick black and white fur. They, they look kind of like a cross between a border collie and a husky. Teton has an all-white face except for one black patch covering his right eye. He's training to become a dog that will work with wildlife officials to push bears out of human-populated areas. But these dogs can do much more than that. They can track big mammals like cougars and help with search and rescue efforts. They're kind of like wildlife super dogs. And once you've seen them in action, you never forget it. So our test is set up essentially just around the periphery of the yard that you see here. Teton's instructor and handler for the day is Niels Pedersen. He's the co-director of the Wind River Bear Institute here in Florence, Montana. The Institute trains these dogs for wildlife officials all over the world, and they use the strangest training course you'll ever see. Niels has hidden animal parts, bear skulls and paws, and even a full dead cougar all over this meadow. It's about the size of two football fields. These are animal parts. These are bear parts that have been donated to us uh, from Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Animals that have been killed in conflict scenarios, so these aren't parts that we've <laughs> collected ourselves in other words. The different animal parts are spread out strategically around the field. Niels is testing to see if Teton can pick up the scent and then to see if he can track that object. Niels sets the eager puppy on the course. As soon as he catches his first whiff of something his head snaps to the left and this youngster shows the determination of a much older dog. It's actually pretty funny to watch. He only weighs about 15 pounds but he's so serious and focused. His little puppy paws carry him directly to two bear skulls. Wow, that's a gruesome sight. <laughs> there is no fur or skin left on the skull, just muscle and dried blood. The grizzly scene doesn't stop Teton. He wastes no time chewing on the bear part. He's in puppy heaven. Is that 
That is so good. You're crazy. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> you hear that? Teton may seem a bit aggressive, but that's actually a good thing for this test. Niels needs to see that a poppy is willing to engage with a bear or a cougar. They can't show any fear or boredom. A lot of our real good dogs are kind of thrilled by it, right? They, they uh, um, see something new and scary and they want to get in there, you know. And that's kind of an interesting trait. We leave the bear skulls behind and continue on to see what else Teton will find. He's barely taller than the grass he's walking through. Next, he discovers a complete bear carcass, fur and all. That's it. Find it. Whoa. Good find, buddy. Good boy. He doesn't waste time pouncing on the bear. He finds the tongue and starts pulling and chewing on it. Did you find another bear? It might seem a little grotesque or morbid, but it's necessary training for the job this dog will be doing. Niels actually encourages Teton. This bear carcass is a great way for the young dog to get familiar with what he's going to encounter in the field. The smell, the look, even the feel of the bear. Teton climbs on top of the bear and starts tugging its fur with his teeth. So this guy's pretty fresh. He was killed about a week and a bit ago for getting into a getting into a trouble with a guy in a jacuzzi, actually. A man was having a relaxing evening in his backyard hot tub when this black bear wandered in. The man tried to scare the bear off. The hot tub man even flicked his towel at the bear. And I guess flipped his towel at the bear, which worked momentarily, but then uh, the bear followed him to his house. And when a bear is comfortable getting that close to humans and seems to be unafraid, that's an issue. It's unsafe for the bear and unsafe for humans. Montana wildlife officials had little choice. They lethally removed this bear. He was just being too pushy, huh? Poor guy. And this is exactly why Niels works to train dogs like Teton. A wildlife officer armed with one of these dogs could help prevent a bear from ever getting into a situation where it would need to be killed. We need to have dogs that are capable of addressing bear issues like that so that in the future, you know, if it's a bear that's possible for us to work with, we can, and to, rather than have to destroy it. And you can't talk about Karelian bear dogs without talking about Carrie Hunt. Oh, hello. It only took me 30 years to get here. <laughs> Just a two-minute drive away from the training field is the headquarters of the Wind River Bear Institute. Carrie is the founder and co-director, along with Niels. Carrie is a legend in the bear world. She's worked as a field biologist since the late 70s, and I've known of her for decades, but I've never really properly met her. I feel like I'm on hallowed ground. Her house is surrounded by kennels with grown Karelian bear dogs that Carrie has trained. I step through her front door. Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> Almost lost the microphone there. Yeah, you're a bundle of fun. This is Carrie's lead dog, Akela. He's almost 14. Yeah. But I've done easily well over a thousand grizzly bear and black bear pushes with him. Carrie gives us a nearly two hour long tour of her home and training facility. Pictures of all the dogs she's raised, biologists she's worked with. Look at all that. These uh, are those memories with every memories, single one of those. Eh? All the footprints of the dogs that have gone to heaven. Carrie's been training these dogs for years. She's developed a system using these dogs to reduce and prevent conflict between humans and bears. Our idea is to ask the bear to make the right choices. She refers to this philosophy as bear shepherding. We don't want to force the choice on him, but we are giving the bear the opportunity to make the right choice before something happens to it. It sounds like a very diplomatic way of doing things, and it is, because bears are intelligent enough to figure out right versus wrong and make decisions based on learned experiences. It's how they've become so successful in the wild. But this way of doing things is a radical departure from the way problem bears were handled when Carrie first got on the job. I uh, started out in Yellowstone and watched as bear after bear died many times, many times in the same place for the same conflict. 
A grizzly or black bear would come into a campground because someone had left some food out on a table. The bear would be captured, transported far away into some remote wilderness, and released. But the bears are smart. They remember where they can get an easy sandwich. So they just wander back to the same campground, right back to the same picnic basket. But this time, as a repeat offender, that animal would often be killed. They'd come back and ultimately destroyed. And I just decided I need to change this. Carrie wanted to break that pattern. I love training animals. I know I can teach bears. I know I can, if I can find the right breed of dog, I should be able to use dogs to help these bears move away from places they shouldn't be. So Carrie went on the hunt. She needed to find a dog breed that could stand up to bears, hold their own in a face-off with a black bear or even a grizzly. A dog that Carrie could use to push bears out of areas they didn't belong. So she studied and read about different types of dogs, combing whatever information she could find on dogs all around the world. As Carrie was looking for the right dog, she started to think of different ways to scare off a bear without the need to be lethal. And that is how I came up with bear spray. That's right. Carrie Hunt is the inventor of bear spray. You know, the bear repellent in a can used on attacking or aggressive bears. To develop bear spray, she began with a system of trial and error. It took her a while to find something effective. Working with a captive bear, they tested several non-lethal deterrents. Carrie was a grad student at the time, and she enlisted the help of a volunteer she knew very well, her mum. Carrie placed her mum behind the bars in front of the captive bear. She'd show up in a black garbage sack with (laughs) holes for her eyes, and her job was to stomp at the bear, and if it charged, not back off, mom, or you've ruined everything. And... (laughs) and spray the bear (laughs) or deploy whatever. And then she'd go back and sit in the car and wait while I wrote down everything, right? They tried using boat horns, skunk repellent. We tried the umbrella. We tried the railroad flare. None of them worked. Finally, she used Holt, which was a spray that the postman used to repel attacking dogs. Every mailman has a story, right? And it sprayed out in a little pencil-thin, six-foot-long spray. And it worked. It's made with capsaicin. It's the same stuff that makes hot peppers hot. So Carrie beefed it up and turned that pencil-thin spray to an 80-mile-an-hour, three-foot-wide burst so people wouldn't have to aim it so carefully. And there you have it. Bear spray. So figuring out ways to keep people and bears safe was never far from Carrie's mind. One day... Standing in line in a grocery store, she saw a magazine. In it was the answer. The answer to finding her perfect dog breed. In that grocery store line, in the magazine that caught Carrie's attention, was a series of remarkable photographs. They showed a biologist in Finland releasing a captured brown bear. The bear runs out of the cage, it turns, and then attacks one of the researchers. It's a seriously disturbing set of photographs, and I remember seeing them at the time. So this was the big bear dog who was tied up at the time. They turned him loose. He bit the bear repeatedly in the rear and got the bear off the man. Carrie had found her dog. It was a Karelian bear dog, and she wanted to know everything there was to know about them. She wasted no time, bought a flight to Finland to track down the man in the photo, and she found him, exactly where you'd expect to find a Finnish bear biologist, in a cabin in the woods. And we start to talk, and I had met my soulmate, and he was all about how bears think and feel and dogs, how they think and feel. And we talked till three or four in the morning with our Finnish, what we call Bibles, because he could hardly speak English. I, I definitely couldn't speak Finnish. Carrie spends months with this man in Finland, learning all she can about the breed. 
Karelian bear dogs were originally bred as hunting dogs, bred to hunt grizzly bears in Finland and northern Russia. Doesn't get much tougher than that. They are incredibly intelligent, primitive dog that has not been bred to serve man. So they don't work with you, they work for you. They want to do their job and you don't need to be a part of it. Carrie says that makes them independent thinkers. Dogs working with bears need to be able to make quick decisions on their own and be prepared. She was hoping she could harness that hunter instinct because she had a new idea about how to release captured bears. Instead of moving the bear far away, what if she released it right in the same spot where it had been captured, where it had got into trouble? The ultimate goal is to get the bear to not want to return to this site. She calls this new idea a hard release. Here's how it works. After a bear is captured, usually in what's called a culvert trap, picture a big tube-shaped cage on wheels that can be towed from the back of a truck. You make sure everybody's in formation. We are back at the tailgate of the truck. And there are officers lined up with guns to shoot rubber bullets and firecracker shells. We make sure that we the shooters are on the far ends of the lineup of dogs. We try to have at least a dog on each side. Once all the humans and dogs are in place, the culvert door is opened, gingerly. And the bear normally takes a second sticks his little head out, looks both sides of the culvert, sees where the dogs are, and bolts. And at that point, we try to hit him with rubber bullets, spanking him. Send cracker shell rounds behind him. And the dogs are yelling at him, we're coming for you, we're coming for you, we, we really want to come for you. And the bear is running for his life. And we are saying, as humans, we are dominant over you. You have to leave. This may sound a bit rough, like it would stress out the bear, but that's kind of the point. This is tough love. It's a tactic that might sound familiar to any of you who are parents. It's a bad experience on the site you don't want him to go back to. We developed the concept of hard releases on site, where we turn them loose in the campground, they're causing trouble, and they won't go back there. It makes sense, right? It's a negative experience in the location where we don't want the bear to be. A very memorable negative experience. You can imagine the bear running away thinking to itself, definitely not coming back here. It's called aversive conditioning. The way we train is to get the bear to prefer the behaviors we want, but they're making the choices. It's the way we learn to do the preferred behaviors. You know, there are consequences negative or positive, to your choices. That's how we teach. Carrie calls this bear shepherding. And bears, being as smart as they are, pick up on these lessons pretty darn quickly. Carrie had done it. She'd found her dog and figured out a better way to manage bear populations, to teach bears. But that was just the beginning. Now she just needed to get the wildlife officials on board. Rocky Spencer and Bruce Richards were the first guys to get involved with Karelian bear dogs in Washington State. Come on in. That's good. How's it going? I don't know. I meet Bruce at his house. Now retired, he was a wildlife enforcement officer with the state of Washington. I worked with him briefly about 20 years ago. You remember me, don't you? You remember us meeting Bruce? I'm trying to think back. Are you kidding me? All I've been doing is talking about you the whole way here. Chris Moore. Oh, we got stinking guy with an Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we were never really close, so it's fair that he doesn't quite remember me, but there is no excuse for mistaking me as an Australian. 
Bruce has greeted us at the door in a faded pair of camo pants and a green shirt that reads Vietnam War Alumni on it. Shall we take our boots off here? Almost every square inch of wall space in his home is covered with framed pictures of him with bears or cougars, or from his time as a helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. Thanks for having us over. He proudly shows us one photograph of him with his Cobra helicopter. We landed on a barge out there in the Mekong River. He'd been providing air protection for a boat fleet heading up the river when somebody on the ship radioed for him to land on the barge. Hey, come on down for a cold one. So we went down, they gave us a cold Coke from a refrigerator, and we didn't get that much very often. I'm here to meet with Bruce because he worked with the first dog that Carrie Hunt placed with a wildlife agency, Mishka. Mishka was a feisty, headstrong character, a male Karelian, and the son of the very first dog that Carrie brought over from Finland. But it wasn't easy to get Mishka to Washington State. Some bureaucrats were concerned about the liability with a dog on the team. Bruce and his colleague, Rocky Spencer, had already landed in trouble for using a personal yellow lab to track animals. And Rocky, about that time, had read about the Carilion Bear Dogs out of Carrie Hunt's uh, kennels. Rocky really wanted one of those dogs to help with his work. I knew Rocky well, and Rocky was always going to do what Rocky was going to do. Anyway, uh, Rocky brought Mishka over as a puppy. It was one of those ask-for-forgiveness-later sort of moves. Rocky started using Mishka to help with his work. They would track down orphan cougar kittens and push bears out of residential areas. Mishka wanted to do what Mishka wanted to do, and to get him to do what you wanted him to do was a real effort. Mishka was always running after one smell or another. Once, while riding in the back of a truck, Mishka busted out the screen window of the canopy and took off running down a mountain road. And next thing you know, he's treated a 180-pound cougar by himself. (laughs) Rocky would take Mishka to schools to educate kids on bear safety. And that's one of the things about Karelians. Tough as nails in the field, but just big softies with kids. They'd try to get Mishka on the local news whenever they could to show the bureaucrats that having a dog was helpful to the work. There was never a dull moment, and Mishka's popularity was growing in the local community. But then, tragedy struck. Bruce was standing in line to get food at a retirement party. And a guy walked up to me, a captain, and says, Jeez, Bruce, Rocky just got killed. I thought, I looked at him, well, that is a pretty crappy joke. But it wasn't a joke. Rocky had been in a helicopter capturing bighorn sheep in the mountains, and there was an accident. Rocky had been killed. It shook the community, and it left Mishka orphaned. After Rocky's death, it wasn't clear what would happen with Mishka. The dog wasn't officially part of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. But Mishka's popularity at this point was high, and the community didn't want to see him leave. There was one way. Bruce stepped in, and he took ownership of Mishka to carry the bat on and take care of his good friend's partner. Bruce's captain agreed to allow a one-year pilot period, kind of a test phase, to see if Mishka could stay. Then the successes started to roll in. There was an elk poached in the Olympic National Park, and the game wardens knew who did it. But they couldn't find any evidence to prove it. Park officials were deployed. They spent 800 man-hours trying to find the remains of the elk, evidence that would allow them to convict the poacher. They couldn't find anything. I said, well, you know, I, Rocky used this dog for finding dead things, and guess he got pretty good at it. Bruce volunteered. Maybe Mishka would be able to find something. But once he got to the site, he began to regret volunteering. It wasn't easy country to hike into. It was knife knife ridges. It was just uh, really rugged crap. And up and down. I mean, it wasn't flat. Bruce thought to himself, this can't be right. No elk would come up into this rough terrain. So I put Mishka's collar on, told him we're working. The slopes were steep. Bruce had to climb over rocks and fallen trees. It was now almost a full year after the hunter had poached the elk. 800 man-hours had turned up nothing. 
Bruce didn't have hopes they'd find anything. But then, within minutes of being there, Mishka starts digging in some rocky shale. Bruce was about to call the dog off and go and search a different area. Next thing you know, he comes running by me with a big neck bone of an elk, and he's bragging about it. I mean, he comes down, and he kind of, I mean, he's coming down, but he, and he, he's, he's kind of, you know, bringing his shoulders up a little bit, you know, and lifting oh, his head. I, look what yeah, I've look got, what kind I of found, thing. I found it, you know, I mean, you know. Uh, Holy crap. It was the neck bone of an adult elk, and it had sore marks on it. Bingo. The game wardens used the evidence and convicted the poacher. Mishka was able to do in 10 minutes what humans couldn't do in almost a year of trying. That did it. The pilot period was a success. Bruce and Mishka were a team. And because of Mishka, um, the chief of enforcement decided to make a Carillion Bear Dog program in the state. which would be the first one in the United States. Mishka was the first Carillion bear dog in the United States working with a fish and wildlife officer. Mishka was official. Bruce and Mishka worked side by side every day for the next decade, tracking wildlife, chasing bears, finding cougars, helping with search and rescue. Bruce told me that in the area he worked with Mishka, they haven't had to capture a bear because of nuisance behavior in three years. 10 or 15 years ago, Bruce was catching three bears a week. So I guess I was very damn successful. Bruce has been in the trenches his whole life. In the army, you know, we are the point of the sword. Out here in the field, the game warden is still the point of the sword. And, and to have that dog and the tools that dog gives you as a game warden, I don't think it's, uh, I don't, just don't think you're going to find anything that can beat it. Mishka retired in 2015 after 12 years of service. But even in old age, towards the end of his life, Mishka only wanted to sleep in the back of Bruce's truck. He just wanted to be in my truck. So all I had to do in the night is just open my door and he'd go in that truck and... Yeah. Right till the end, he wanted to be working. He did. Mishka passed away in December of 2018. He left a legacy that has changed the way wildlife officials do their work. And he's paved the way for other Karelian bear dogs in Washington state, several of them, working to help wildlife and people live together. And now, Carrie Hunt has trained over 160 bear dogs, and wildlife agencies all over the world follow her system and do more than 800 bear releases or pushes a year. So we are their shepherds, and, you know, that means we are there to guide them into safety. It makes all of us shepherds of these animals. You know, we were put on this earth to be stewards of the environment of animals, and I think we're doing that. And Carrie's program continues to grow. Her family of dogs are on the front line, where the rubber hits the road, in our complex relationship with wild animals. Hey, Tito. Puppy, puppy. And remember our little puppy friend, Tom. <laughs> Oh, good boy. Two days good after he found boy. all those animal parts in the training meadow, he was put on a plane, bound for Alaska, the next frontier for him and his breed. Teton will be the first Karelian bear dog to join the National Park Service. He'll be stationed full-time in Denali National Park. This little ball of energy, now officially recognized by the federal government and ready to take on any bear that crosses his path. If you want to see what a Karelian bear dog puppy looks like, and I suggest you do, check out Teton on our Instagram at The Wild Pod. A big thanks to Sarah Diggins and Quinn Corcoran for their amazing photographs and video. It was great having you guys along. 
The Wild will be back in two weeks. If you haven't listened to season one, now is the perfect time to catch up. On our next episode of The Wild, I'm going to sit down with Daryl Hilaire, an elder of the Lummi Nation. It's one of the largest tribes in Washington State. The Lummi and other Native Americans were in the Pacific Northwest long before European settlers arrived. They saw this place when it was the ancient wild. We'll learn how the traditions of native storytelling are used by indigenous people to keep their stories of wild animals and the land alive. The wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, and protect it. We have more information on our website, thewildpod.org. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle, in partnership with my work at Chris Morgan Wildlife. Our producer is Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes Dave Brown, James Bretz, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Kyle Norris, Dyer Oxley, T.O. Popescu, Mariah Powell, Brendan Sweeney, Jeannie Yandel. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks for listening.